due process reminds one of a lawless state of affairs where might was right in our constitution which rests on the foundation of the rule of law such high handed and arbitrary actions have no place such excesses at the hands of the executive will have to be dealt with the heavy hand of the law the president and the governors have been given a certain degree of discretion also justice an ray speaking for the supreme court in samshar singh explained that whenever the constitution requires the exercise of any power or function being on the topic as such let me ignite this audience with the recent judgment of the supreme court for a clearer concept of what i would like to say in further furtherance of the topic in ray directions in the matter of demolition of structures writ petition civil number 295 2022 it just came 3 4 days ago it's not yet reported in the reports the judgment written by justice b r gavai along with justice vishwanathan said and i quote if a citizen's house is demolished merely because he is an accused or even for that matter a convict that too without following the due process as prescribed by law in our considered view it will be totally unconstitutional for more than one reason firstly the executive cannot declare a person guilty as this process is the fundamental aspect of judicial review only on the basis of accusations if the executive demolishes the properties or property of such an accused person without following the due process of law it would strike at the basic principles of rule of law and is not permissible under the constitution the executive cannot become a judge and decide that a person accused is guilty and therefore punish him even before the court could convict him by demolishing his residential or commercial properties such an act of the executive would be transgressing its limits the supreme court went on to say the chilling sight of a bulldozer demolishing a building when authorities have failed to follow the basic principles of natural justice and have acted without adhering to the principles of due process reminds one of a lawless state of affairs where might was right in our constitution which rests on the foundation of the rule of law such high handed and arbitrary actions have no place such excesses at the hands of the executive will have to be dealt with the heavy hand of the law our constitutional ethos and values would not permit any such abuse of power and such misadventures cannot be tolerated by the court of law unquote this is one stark example of executive excesses in recent years further and in the era of tribalization or tribunalization however you want to pronounce it the constant refrain is that the executive trenches into areas of adjudication and therefore accused of usurping judicial functions by appointing persons with executive bias the reason is they say that the high courts are have so much of docket load so much of pendency therefore let us create tribunals to unload the pressure on the high court initially it started with the service tribunal central uh, administrative tribunal state administrative tribunals and that experiment has failed in certain states and the matters i am told have gone back to the high court but then it went on from one tribunal to another tribunal to another tribunal no doubt in some cases the tribunals may be a good opportunity for retired judges to have a rehabilitation but at the same time who are the members technical or otherwise who are assisting such judges is the question in roger matthew the constitution bench of the supreme court issued a writ of mandamus to the ministry of law and justice central government to carry out a judicial impact assessment of all the tribunals the central government responded with the notification of tribunal appellate tribunal and other authorities qualification experience and other conditions of service of members rules 
2020. This was again challenged by the Madras Bar Association on the ground that the rules were violative of the principles of separation of powers and independence of judiciary. The Supreme Court has directed that the union shall constitute a National Tribunals Commission which shall act as an independent body to supervise appointments and functioning of tribunals, to consider disciplinary proceedings and to take care of administrative and infrastructural needs of tribunals. This is in order to maintain independence in judicial adjudication. In this regard, I must say that the relationship between the President vis-à-vis -vis the Parliament under Article 74 and Governors in relation to State Legislature and Article 163 and the Executive respectively have been the centre of controversy in a series of cases before the Supreme Court. Although not entirely ceremonial in everyday exercise of executive power, the President and the Governors have been given a certain degree of discretion also. Justice A. N. Ray, speaking for the Supreme Court in Samshar Singh, explained that whenever the Constitution requires the exercise of any power or function, the satisfaction of the President of the Governor is not their personal satisfaction or anybody else's satisfaction vicariously arrived at, I may say. It is the satisfaction in the constitutional sense, particularly when the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers is not contemplated. This is when there is purely discretionary exercise of power by the President and the governors of the states. Such is the friction between political incentives and constitutional methods that in a contrary landscape, Checks and balances are necessary even on the lawmaking power of presidents and governors acting on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. Equivalent to a parliamentary legislation, the Constitution authorizes the executive to exercise original legislative power. The president may promulgate ordinances under Article 123, and it is easy to remember the governors on 213, 123 and 213, that is how we studied as a student, provided that at least one house of the parliament or the legislature must not be in session and that the president must be satisfied that circumstances exist which render it necessary for her to take immediate action. Practically promulgated by the president on satisfaction of the ministers, ordinances are products of legislative power vested in the executive and beyond the ordinary grounds of judicial review. Nevertheless, ordinances must be laid before both houses once the parliament reconvenes. Finding a convenient path to lawmaking sans legislative approval, several governments have abused the possibility of re-promulgating ordinances. In the famous case of D.C. Vatva, the Supreme Court frowned on ordinances being kept alive for periods ranging from 3 to 14 years merely by re-promulgation and converted an exception into a norm. The Supreme Court denigrated it as Ordinance Raj. This usurpation of legislative power by the executive was held contrary to India's constitutional scheme. Ultimately, recently, a seven-judge bench in Krishna Kumar also affirmed the view that was taken in D.C. Vadva and held that re-promulgation of ordinances is a fraud on the constitution and a subversion of democratic legislative processes. On that note, I will now turn to judicial review of parliamentary and executive action. On September 17, 1787, George Washington, the then president of the Constitutional Convention, put in two sentences as the essence of the judicial task. He said, and I quote, Individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest. It is at all times difficult to draw with precision the line between those rights which must be surrendered and those which may be reserved." Unquote. Drawing the line is, in my view, the core task of the judicial organ under the Constitution. Of all the unanticipated political developments since 1787, 
none has been more consequential than the acceptance of judicial review by the Supreme Court of United States in Marbury versus Madison. I need not go into the details of that case, but at that time, James Madison in, 19, in 1788, in the, on the separation of powers in Federalist Papers, number 47, the quoting of that merits some interest. Quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the hands or the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny." Unquote. Since then, this principle has been exported all over the world, including into India, where the Constitution, since its inception, in Articles 32 and 226, read with Article 13, have recognized the principle of judicial review. Political insularity is one aspect, the other is with regard to impartiality. The third component is the position of courts within the larger political system and their functional relationship with the other branches of the system. Independence of judiciary is more closely related to supremacy of the law. Judicial independence and supremacy of the law work together to guarantee that rule of law is not to be eroded by political pressures in existence at any particular point of time. Insulating judges from political influence advances the same object. Both these concepts are therefore important underpinnings to the rule of law. The next aspect is whether independence of the judiciary is related to the concept of judicial accountability. My answer is yes. The two values are to be perceived as complementary rather than antithetical. Judicial independence is merely the other side of the coin from judicial accountability. The two are not at war with each other, but rather are complements. Neither is an end in itself, but rather means to an end or a variety of ends surrounding the constitutional ideals. The further aspects on judicial independence I would not like to touch upon, except Quoting Justice Frankfurter in Baker versus Carr when he said, quote, the court's authority possessed of neither the purse nor the sword ultimately rests on sustained public confidence in its moral sanction. I am always concerned about the public confidence in courts. The rule of law, which is defended by an independent judiciary, plays a crucial function by ensuring that civil and political rights and civil liberties are safe and equality and dignity of citizens are not at risk. Ultimately, the extent of the judiciary and its independence relates to independence, impartiality, integrity of the men and women holding judicial office. It is therefore all important to appoint meritorious judges who have the pulse of the Indian society and the country in their hearts and the rule of law in their mind while seeking to render justice.